And uh, again, it is a joyous day when we have the blessing of being able to share in one of the key celebrations and declarations of the Christian life. If you'll recall, Jesus himself, when he was baptized, John was asking, why would we do this? And he said, let's do this to fulfill all righteousness. And Jesus fulfilled every piece of the law, all righteousness, so that his perfect righteousness could be handed over to those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so by the time he left and gave us a task, he said to go into the world and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, we have the opportunity to share the joy of the, the gospel at work. He told us to make disciples, and making disciples happens in all kinds of contexts. Uh, with people that we've just met, in, in community, and in the home. And so we celebrate today with the Hawkins family, as Courage Hawkins has been uh, declaring his faith in Jesus Christ. And Jeff Hawkins comes to baptize his own son. And so just remind you of what that means. It is a, a public declaration that says that I'm ready to say to the world around that I belong to Jesus. And Courage has, has shown that he's uh, believed in the gospel, turned from sin, and uh, walking in faith, and now wants to declare that publicly. It's also an opportunity to show the gospel. That in that act of baptism, we can see the gospel played out before our very eyes. That we, when we trust in him, are buried with Christ in our sin and died to that sin, and we're raised to new life in Him. And so that picture of the gospel is going to happen right before you this morning. What a joy that is. And then it becomes a time of celebration. So uh, I just want to read to you from Romans chapter 6, uh, which reminds us that uh, we need to remember, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death in order that... Uh, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so we're going to just uh, celebrate this morning. If you want to stand in support of courage this morning because you've been involved in his life with his family and teaching and sharing, uh, I invite you to do that. And I invite Jeff and courage to come into the water with me here. As I stand by you guys and we stand by you as a church uh, in this time of celebration and declaration. So Jeff... Love you, brother, and uh, excited to share this time with you guys this morning. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Jeff's helping me here. Uh, we want to share that testimony of courage. We have a video ready for you where he gets to share with you his own faith in Jesus Christ, his own testimony. So let's watch that first, and then we'll take this time of celebration. Yes. But it won't work. <laughs> We're all sinners. 
and Christ is, and Jesus is the only one who can save us and deserves Jesus.
Well, good morning, and what a beautiful way to start a morning, huh? Yeah. I can't think of a better way to start off the church service than to celebrate a new child adopted into the family of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful, beautiful thing that is. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we uh, enter into our uh, worship time of singing. Um, choir practice. For those of you who want to be part of a, we're going to have a special choir for the Easter service. And so uh, Tracy is kind of heading that up to Dan, right? And the two of you, I think, are doing that at 5 tonight. 5 o'clock tonight. So if you want to be a part of it, come and join them and uh, prepare for that. It's going to be awesome. Uh, just an announcement. We have a family meeting for those who are members. <clears throat> for those who are interested in seeing how our membership uh, meetings go, we call them family meetings. And that's coming up on March 7th. Now, last week we handed out some slips. Uh, that had the information on what we're going to be covering and what we're going to be talking about. If you did not get one of those slips, let Shauna know and she will get you a slip. And also there will be an email coming out this week that will have all of the information that's on those slips. So we want to make sure that everybody understands what's on the agenda and, and those things. So that will be there. Uh, community groups are ongoing. Folks, if you're not a part of a community group, you are missing out on a blessing. i got to tell you. Uh, they're, they're awesome. And we have accommodated everyone's needs. So if some are uncomfortable uh, getting together still in person, we have an online one on Wednesday nights. And uh, I have the privilege of being a part of that one, and it is a tremendous blessing. So if you want information on, on that and the link and all of that, I can, I'd be happy to send that out to you. Uh, for that, but the other groups are meeting in person. There's a Wednesday night uh, group and there's a Thursday night group, so you have a, a choice of nights. And those um, those are from six to eight, um, so you'll be you'll want to be doing that. So Thursdays are at the shoemaker's house and Wednesdays are at the broker's house. So if you want more information, again, you can talk to me or you can talk to Sean and we'll, we'll hook you up with that. Uh, folks, if you've been around, you know we've been talking about the missions offering. So February and into, into March, the first part of March, we are we do our missions um, offerings. Uh, we, we do those collections rather than rather than having missions uh, events throughout the year as, as a lot of churches do. We choose to, to kind of centralize that and we're going to divide that up um, as we go um, uh, to the to the different groups we've got Utah Idaho uh, International Mission Board North American Mission Board and Calvary Family Churches those all receive just like we would if we if we had the Annie Armstrong uh, uh, or any of those others that that they will, we will give to those but we just uh, choose this time to focus on that so uh, I ask you to be in prayer if you haven't already ask what God would would lead you to give above and beyond what you normally give. And there's opportunities, there's, there's monetary amounts on those slips if you want to take one or two and, and fill those out. Also, if there's not an amount up there that you want to give, there are blank ones too. Um, and you can combine it however you want. But for those of you who wait till the last minute, and I know I'm not talking to any of you guys in here, but um, it is drawing to a close. We've got about a couple weeks left here so uh, for that. So if you want to participate, you feel the Lord is leading you to do that. We would encourage you to do that. And we'll have a video uh, at the uh, at offering time to talk about where some of that money goes. So you guys can see where your money is going and the impacts that it's having. It's a, it's a very beautiful thing. Uh, and then last thing that I'll share with you. Well, uh, what I do want to share, I guess I can share this because it's in the bulletin. Uh, up to this point, we've raised $1,043. Um, our goal this year was uh, $8,800. Um, but above and beyond that, our goal is that you and you, the Lord, your your hearts and life it is, and that's that's really the goal. So so whatever the Lord needs you to give is is what it's about. We're not here to you know advocate for a certain amount or anything else. It's between it's between you and God. Um, and then Thursday mornings, if you don't have anything going on at six a.m. Thursday mornings besides sleep, uh, we chose that time because most people aren't working. Most people don't have conflicts. Um, again, other than sleep, but. Um, we come and we have a time of prayer, and we've had some folks, uh, more and more folks are starting to show up for that, and it's a real blessing. And, um, you know, we talked about that last week at the, uh, in our message that, you know, we, we need to train ourselves and we need to practice what we, what we uh, do so we can fight the good fight, and, and prayer is part of that. And so if you want to be a part of that, I would encourage you to do that if you want to be blessed. So let's open in a word of prayer, and then we're going to turn to the Lord and, and lift up our voices to Him. Heavenly Father. Wow, thank you for an amazing beginning to this service this morning with this 
beautiful picture of how you allow us to enter into your kingdom. Lord, the sacrifices made by your son and how we identify with that as we're, we're buried in his likeness or raised again to newness of life. And, and what a blessing to see this young man uh, make that profession of faith and come before you publicly and declare his love for you as a testimony to others. And I pray that we inspire others uh, and, and draw them closer to you if they haven't already surrendered their lives. I know it was a blessing to me, and I'm sure it was a blessing to all of us who, who watched that. So thank you for that. We look forward to that day when we see you face to face. And Lord, as we prepare to worship you today, align our hearts. Help us to eliminate the distractions of the world, the things that, that take our minds off of this, and help us focus on you, you and you alone. And may we raise up the praises to you, and may you be the one that's glorified. May we give praise, honor, and glory in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You have old people like us do this. You run the risk of hearing some old songs. So, uh, but we're going to be talking about the King of Kings this morning as we hear our message. So this is an older old chorus, and it's a round. Okay, you know what a round is? Verse 1, 2. Some people sing it, and the other people sing it, and it kind of goes like that. So we'll sing it together first, all together, and then we'll split it up. And guys, you'll sing with me, ladies, you'll sing with Tracy, and we'll see how it goes. Okay? Here we go. King of Kings, Lord of Lords.
Jesus, I just want to bless your name as we've been doing in song. I want to bless your name in prayer. I want to bless your name in tithes and offerings that can be given to the activity and the, the building of your kingdom. Jesus, there are missionaries on the front lines. There are missionary disciple makers right here in these pews. God, there are your people trying with their hearts, minds, souls, and strengths to, to honor you. And to that end, we pray that you would bless the giving that happens here today. We ask that you would make it function and work for the, the furthering of your kingdom, for the magnifying of your name, for the, for the lifting up of Jesus Christ in all places, from Nampa and to the ends of the earth. God, would you let each one of these here this morning, as they participate in different ways, would you give them that thrill of joy, of being a part of something? A kingdom that is coming and a kingdom that is already established by Jesus Christ and you will make it complete in your time. Father, we declare our love for you this morning through all these means, including our giving. Receive them with joy and with honor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have certain stories in the New Testament, like the parable of the lost sheep, where you leave 99 to go find the one. And so God doesn't forsake that one lost sheep. You have these small micro people groups where the gospel has not flowed yet because of geography, because of distance, because of cost, because of uh, culture, because of racism. I really feel that these micro peoples are part of this heart to go after all sheep, to go after their remnant. Amazon, you can go a day without seeing another living soul. It's kind of freaky. But a lot of the reason why you can't see people is because they're hidden. These are hidden peoples. Small population, widely dispersed. They have centuries of a bloody history where they've been exploited. They're animists. They believe in spirits. When you live that way, you tend to be dominated by fear. I see marginalized people. I see forgotten people. I see invisible people that are in desperate need of the gospel. The area is massive. And so to get from where I live, which is already a jungle city, I have to get into a land plane and fly to another port city. And then the next day we get in a boat. And in this slow boat, we travel sometimes three days to get to where we're going. Because we're going into areas where the gospel is not. Sometimes it just takes time. But recently we have noticed just God opening some doors. God has been working to send out missionaries, indigenous men and women, where there's no evangelical presence. A well-trained and called indigenous man would be much more effective. They tend to be able to get into hard reach areas without the government restrictions. You have fewer language limitations. A lot of my work is training them. So if I want to teach an indigenous man how to do story, he has to see me do it first. And after a while of walking alongside, he's very capable at that point. One partner in particular, he wants to go work with a group that has killed outsiders that have walked in. He's like, I don't care. I've got someone to go do it. And this is such a, a 180 from most indigenous culture that you have to look at him and say, God brought this change to this man. You see families coming to Christ, you do see village headmans getting permission to come in. It really confirms everything that we're out there to do, to go out and make disciples of all nations. When we have those things happen, we sit back and go, okay, this is what it's all about. They can go and they can teach others, and those people can teach others. I want to see this momentum away from the jungle where I can say, look, I didn't see it happen, I wasn't there, but I know the gospel has reached these dark parts. When the borders of the Lottie Man Christmas offering give, it allows us to do things like buy an outdoor motor that gets us up river, to get equipment that we need to help us stay out there in the jungle. I have been supported by Lottie Man. Y'all's generosity is, is a luxury that I never want to take for granted. So I want to say thank you for that. God is faithful in the hard times as he is in the good times, and our mandate doesn't change. These people groups in the jungle, you could be born, live, and die without ever hearing the name of our Savior. So someone has to go. Because if we don't go, no one's going to go. If we don't train people to go, no one's going to go. It's worth it.
that kind of stuff <laughs> through our giving and the missions offering. Um, children's age four through grade three, you can come join your teachers up front and dismiss the Calvary Kids class. Join me as we read God's Word. Our passage today is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 through 16. I'll give you just a second to turn there. Um, it can be found on page 577 in the Black Pew Bibles. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, please feel free to take one of those from the back of the pew and consider it our gift to you. So... Again, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 through 16. It reads, Which will display at the proper time, He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, who, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honored in eternal dominion. Amen. All right, let's pray. Oh, Father, mighty God, all at once, Unknowable and yet known and revealed. Magnificent beyond what we can imagine and yet imminent and among us, interacting with what you have made in beautiful and amazing ways. I stand before you with the desire that somehow that revelation, that unveiling, that self-revelation you've given us through your word might just help us see and be in awe of you as we should be. Toward that end, I give this time and I give myself and I pray for your work to be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of the great God whom he calls Father. This was said at, at the opening of a sermon on January 7th in 1855 by the minister of New Park Street Chapel in Southwark, England. J.I. Packer included it in his book, Knowing God. The loftiest, mightiest thing we can be thinking about. The person in the nature of the one we call Father. My friend and professor and fellow pastor at the Calvary Family of Churches, Michael Morgan, he also quotes J.I. Packer, who says... Theology is for doxology and devotion, the praise of God and the practice of godliness. So Dr. Morgan, although I've never heard him make much of that or even really use that title, Dr. Morgan introduces his theology classes this way by saying, theology is for doxology. In case you're not familiar with those words, theology is... Literally in the Greek, it's theos, God, and logos, words. It's God talk. So, it's about statements about God, or more formally, it's the study of God. Theology and doxology, again, literally in the Greek, doxa, grandeur, glory, renown, and words. So, it's glory talk. It's, it's worship and, and formally, a, a doxology is, is a short, worshipful expression. 
And that's precisely what we have before us today in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And if you haven't noticed already, you will before we're done, that this particular short worshipful expression is built on and it is brimming over with theology. This is God talk and glory talk. This is theology for the purpose of doxology, for worship. So Dr. Morgan would say, to fail to worship is to undercut everything we say that we affirm. And it would be contradictory to, to study this and not explode with joy and worship. We seek a God, reveal himself to us through the pages of his scriptures. And I would say that the opposite is also true. To worship without knowing something of who it is that we worship and affirm is both blind and empty. So, so today we get to, to practice what really needs to be the everyday activity of the Christian. Today we seek to unite mind and heart and soul and strength in the worship of God. Wasn't that, after all, the, the greatest command that Jesus gave? It's, it's the highest call and purpose of life. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength. And so today, joining with the, the tenor of this passage before us, we want to know our God. And from our knowing, from our knowing, to, to burst forth in genuine and spontaneous doxology, just like we see Paul doing here. Today we want to say, Behold, this is he who is. We begin to fill in those gaps. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon said this, Oh, there is in contemplating Christ a balm for every wound, in musing on the Father, there is a quietus for every grief. And in the influence of the Holy Ghost, there is a balsam for every sore. Would you lose your sorrow? Would you drown your cares? Then go plunge yourself in the Godhead's deepest sea. Be lost in His immensity. You shall come forth as from a couch of rest, refreshed and invigorated. So are you ready? First Timothy chapter 6. Two little verses, verses 15 and 16. If you're not there already, I invite you to turn there. And we're going to first start, as the passage does, with a, a brief program note, if you will. And then after kind of noting what, what what's, we're dealing with at the opening of the passage, we're going to talk about who he is. We're going to talk about what he's like. And then we observe how we respond. Who he is, what he's like, and how we respond. Now if you're looking with me, the first word of our passage, of course we broke in in the middle of a sentence, is the word which. Which he will display at the proper time. So this word which speaks of, of course it's referring to something else, or in mid-sentence, it speaks of what? If you look above, it speaks of the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can see it in the words in the preceding verse. So if we rewind the tape just a tad to kind of catch the flow of thought heading into where we're at, we recall that, that Paul was redirecting Timothy away from the, the deceptive and cruel master of money and calling him to pursue, to run after, as he flees from that master, to run after other things. He says to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. And then as he calls him to that pursuit, as we heard last week, his point is, if we're going to keep going, we've got to keep rocking the Jesus life. We've got to keep living the way that he called us to live. And keep doing that, and here's the word, until... Until what? Uh, until retirement? Until you've saved up enough? Until your goals are hit? Until we're 
tired of what we're doing and want to move to something else. No, he says, you keep living this way. You keep this charge, Timothy. All these commands in this letter, you keep proclaiming the gospel and staying right there until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there is an occupation that has no retirement. It's the life of a Christian living for the kingdom and the glory of Jesus Christ. You keep living that life until he comes back again. So it's kingdom living with no retirement until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to make just a couple of notes here. Like I said, kind of a program note. I don't want to linger here. And I want to do it because that's the way the text treats this, if you'll notice. The scripture here treats this appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ almost like just a note in the midst of the, the discussion. Because he says, verse 14, Keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. And then he bursts into, I don't want to talk about who's coming. So let's make just a couple of notes we can see from the text and move from that topic, which I know is a big topic and we could linger and there's lots of other places in the scriptures for that. But let's just take note of a couple things. Firstly, he is coming again. He is coming again. When he says, which he will display, that will is certain. We can say that with certainty. Because Jesus, his promise is sure. Didn't he say in John chapter 14 that if I, I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Jesus keeps his promises. He said he's going away. He will indeed return again. So it's certain he is coming again. We can at least know that. We can also at least know that it hasn't happened yet. Again, in the word will, it's both certain and and future, which he will display. That means he hasn't yet displayed it at this time. And this problem of some thinking that maybe Jesus had already arrived for the second time was something Paul dealt with with the, the church in Thessalonica. They were dealing with that. Some were saying, maybe he's already been here and he missed out. And for that reason, Paul speaks uh, abundantly about the details of how we might know whether this has happened yet or not. And that fits in the context of that letter. But you know, Peter had to address the opposite problem. There were people saying, so where is this coming of yours? If you keep talking about it and everything goes on as we have always heard and as we've always known. But Peter says in 2 Peter 3.18, the Lord's not slow in keeping his promises. Yes, this Jesus keeps his promises, but he's not slow in doing so. He's being patient toward you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You see, as the Lord tarries, we should see in his waiting a kindness and a patience. Saying, no, I haven't come yet. It's because I love people. I want all to come. And he knows that some will choose and some will reject. But he's giving them the chance to the jungles. And to the far-reaching places where Jesus has not yet been named. The Lord knows. So we know he's coming again. We know he hasn't yet. And we also know from this little note that Paul gives us that it's in his time. In his time. You see, he says, which he will display at the proper time. And that word proper means his own. Idios. It has to do with what, he, what belongs to him. The timing is his to determine. Just like in Acts chapter 1 verse 7. The apostles were there, and Jesus is about to leave them, and he's already giving them some sense of, you're going to have instruction here, and they want to know about the kingdom, and when is this going to happen, and give me the details. And he says in first, or Acts chapter 1, verse 7, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that my Father has fixed by his own authority. At the proper time, videos, his own. But, you're going to receive power I'm going to keep working through my spirit, and you're going to be my witnesses. So the, the fourth thing that we know is we just take note of this opening of the passage. He hasn't come yet. He is coming again. It's in his timing. But in the meantime, we stay on task. I mean, I'm being simple here. There's lots else to unpack. But is that good enough for us? 
That the New Testament is replete with instructions on how to live the life that pleases God, but a life that corresponds with the ideas and the concepts of the gospel. And it's always lived in light of his coming, over and over and over. Philippians, Paul is talking about, until the day, I want you to be ready for that day. Everything's in anticipation of it, yes. But it's a life that we've been called to, to stay on task until it's time. And friends, he is coming again. He has not yet. If somebody's telling you that, let's get into the details of how we can know that. And it's going to be in his own timing. Let's let the Lord own that. And let's stay on task. Is that fair enough for the note that Paul gives? Because as he says this, this is for Timothy to keep working until that time. You keep your, your Christian life going until that time. Which he's going to display at the proper time. And then it begins. The doxology of this passage. You see, it's like Paul can't help himself. I've got kids that get excited when they get like allowance money or birthday money. It's like it burns a hole in their pocket and they can't wait to go spend it. And after they spend it, when I come home and they've been at the store, they're like, Daddy, Daddy, I can't wait to show you what I've got. They love it. They love to show off this thing that they're so excited about. I feel like Paul's like that here. He's like talking about these other topics and making sure that Timothy knows, hey man, you've got to stay on task until the day that Jesus comes. Oh, we're talking about Jesus? Let me say a couple things about that. This is he who is and begins his doxology. You see, there's a couple things we're going to note about the theology undergirding this that causes such worship. And the first thing is this. He says, he who is, we have to define that he. Who's this pronoun referring to? William MacDonald observes that the Bible scholars are not agreed as to whether this pronoun in this verse and the next refer to God the Father or to the Lord Jesus Christ. Take some time, look at it later, and you say, okay, if it says he, then who are we just talking about? What we were just talking about, the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he has also just said, I charge you in the presence of God who gives to all things uh, and Jesus Christ. So is it God or is it Jesus Christ that he's saying he who is this way? And it only gets more confusing as we go on because as he begins to describe the, the attributes of this person, this pronoun we're trying to define, they seem to apply to God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son, and yet we can't quite pull them apart. You know why that is? Because if we want to ask the question, is he talking about Jesus, the second person, the Son of the Trinity, or God the Father? The answer is yes. Yes, he's talking about he. You see, the first thing we learn as we just unpack this and understand the theology undergirding this praise is that he's talking about this God who is triune. He is triune. One God, eternally existent in three equal persons. I'll say it again. One God, eternally existent in three equal persons. Now, if you know any better, if I knew any better, we could stay all day, all night, all week, working on this one. But let me give you a few things we need to hold on to, just understanding that this triune God is the God of the Bible. First of all, there's unity in this. We are not talking about tritheism. If any of your thinking or your verbiage begins to lean towards this God and that God and that God, these three gods, that's not the God of the Bible. There is unity. Unity in the Trinity. Theologians will speak of the, the simplicity of God. That is, that he's not divided up into parts. He is all of who he is all of the time, and all of his attributes are fully his at all times. The unity of the Godhead. At the same time, we must maintain and hold on to the fact that there is multiplicity. There's unity, but there's multiplicity, because there are distinctions. There are three persons. Distinctions within their roles and their characteristics, Enough to merit the concept for people to try and wrap their mind around this living God and say, well, here's this God, but I see him express himself in distinct persons, we say. Christ is known in relation to the Father. He's not known otherwise, and the Father is known as a Father because there's a distinct and a constant relationship between Father and Son. And the Son is eternally begotten, not created, but ever flowing from God. Always having been begotten, eternally so. And the Holy Spirit eternally always has been proceeding from 
father and son. And so we have these distinctions in what they do and how they function, but they're one, one God in three persons. So we have unity, we have multiplicity, and we have equality. You see, there's not a hierarchy in terms of the, the ultimate being of this God. There's not like the head of the, the Trinity, and then there's the lesser important and the lesser important. They are of the same substance or essence. The early church fathers wrestled over this. How do we put this into words? And they began to say that they were coexistent in three equal persons of the same substance. And so the idea is that in their very nature, essentially, we do not have a greater than or a lesser than. Although we see in the function, so listen, in the being, the very person of God, there is no greater than, lesser than. But in the function, we see purposeful and intentional distinctions in which there are submissions in the activities of God. Only Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, went to the cross, for example. So, A.W. Tozer says, it is most important that we think of God as Trinity, in unity, neither confounding the persons, that is, blending them and saying you must be a little of this and a little of that, nor dividing the substance, as if to think that they're of different essence. Does that help in terms of thinking about the Trinity? This is, this is orthodox doctrine that we need to grasp and hold on to because when we open up and this passage says he who is he's talking about yes Jesus and the father all at once and that's going to permeate the rest of these statements the second thing we find as we think about how this is stated it says he who is this is about his identity and he goes on by saying he who is the blessed and only sovereign the blessed and only sovereign Blessed, that's that supremely blessed, fortunate, in fact, the idea of like the Beatitudes you might remember. Blessed is this one or that one. God himself is to be attributed with blessing, the, the, the goodness, the well-being. He's that kind of praiseworthy one. He's the blessed and he's the only, don't skip over that word. The blessed and the only. It is a logical necessity of reality that he is the only. You see, if you begin to discover the attributes of God and think through who he is and what he's like, if you're talking about infinity, he has infinite knowledge or infinite power, you can't have infinite power, have all of it, if it's being shared with some other being that has infinite power, or any power for that matter. You see? By necessity, there can only be one God. He's the blessed and He's the, the only ruler. So by definition, to be all, all powerful is to have all the power, not share. And because of that power, Paul calls him this title. It's not a, an attribute saying he's like this. He's saying he is this. He's the sovereign. He's the one and only ruler. Sovereign. Potentate, if you're looking at King James. The Greek word is dynastis. It looks like dynasties. That's where we get that word. It's only used a few times, and it has to do with might, with ability, with power, with capability. And he sits at the top of the stack over all others. More might, more capability, more power, and therefore more right, and the only right, to sit on the one and only throne, ruling over all things in all places, over all creation. Somebody say amen. amen. That is the God of the Bible. The one and the only sovereign. And as if that's not enough, Paul's going to continue to define that for us as he says, not only is he only sovereign, let me tell you what that means. He's the king over all the kings. He's the Lord over all the lords. Whoever rules, he's above that ruler. He's the leader over every leader. Every head of state, he's the head of state over. He's the chief. He's the executive. He's the premier. 
What words do we need to say? Paul is multiplying words saying, He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when just a moment ago you thought we were talking about God the Father as the only ruler, the only sovereign, now it's saying that the King of kings and the Lord of lords is the same one name in Revelation twice as certainly Jesus Christ who bears that name. And the same one who in the Old Testament is described as the God of gods and the Lord of lords in the law of Moses. Consistently, forever, eternally so, this is our God. And so I wonder with the psalmist in Psalm chapter 2, maybe you feel this way now. This might be a comfort to us in this season of life as it has been through all of time. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let's burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord, this God, holds them in derision. And then... The psalm goes on to say he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying this, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I have already established who rules. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the anointed one. He's the living God. I've already established that I don't care what they say about what they want to shrug off or not do or change. No ruler, no person is over the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Amen? Amen. Praise God for that. Praise God. Tozer says, God's sovereignty is the attribute by which he rules his entire creation. And therefore, his sovereign, this sovereign God must be all-knowing and all-powerful and absolutely free. If he were none of those things or a portion of those things, he could not be the one and only sovereign. So the scripture here gives us no wiggle room. What we're not able to do is to deny that he is without doubt unquestionably the absolute ruler over all things. We can't push against that unless we want to be like those in Psalm 2 who think that they can to the derision and the laughter of God. Say, who do you think that you are? He is who he is. What we can do, as we live under that sharp, plain reality of him as ruler, what we can do is humbly, humbly explore who he is and how that works. So, Tozer continues by saying, in all its constant stress, on the reality of God's personal concern for his people, and these things are real, he says, on the, on the gentleness, the tenderness, the sympathy, the patience and yearning compassion that he shows towards him. That is our God too. All his attributes at all times. But Tozer says the Bible never lets us lose sight of his majesty and his unlimited dominion over all his creatures. As you contemplate who God is, as you spend time considering every aspect that you possibly can, you will not get your arms around it. But you will not be able to let go as you're in one area of the fact that he rules and reigns. So that is who he is in this passage. Let's move on to ask the question, what is he like? Because as Paul says he's the king of kings and the lord of lords, as we move into verse 16, he begins to describe just a little bit who this one is. Who alone has immortality. Immortality. If we think about these as attributes of God, again, Tozer says, whatever may be correctly ascribed to God or whatever God has in any way revealed as being true of himself, those are attributes. So God is saying, this is true of me, as he reveals that to us on the pages of his scriptures. And he says, who alone, again, nobody like him, we're not talking about any comparable point. That's what we call him holy in a category all his own. No other members in that category but God who alone has immortality. Now, that means deathlessness in this passage. It's athanasia in Greek. You might have heard of euthanasia. We call that a good or a merciful death. The, the, Thanasia part refers to that word death. And here, athanasia means the opposite of death itself. He has deathlessness. 
Now, how is God unique in that? He's the only one who holds it within himself in his very essence. It's, it's his being. It's always been so. What's amazing is that scriptures use that word immortality. It gives us the idea that God can confer the ability to continue on. We talk about what? Eternal life. That can be given as a gift from the one and only immortal. Hebrews says that he, he serves and lives as the great high priest that he is on the basis of an indestructible life. I love that phrase. The Bible just tells us who alone has immortality. And yet, here's the immortal God saying that through the gospel, the possibility of our continuing on immortality is revealed, is made possible. God is unique. His immortality goes both directions, all the way back with no beginning, and all the way forward with no end. Our possibility is that we are created, breathed with life, and God says, I would like you to live with me and continue on in eternal fellowship with this living God. Would you like that? Does that not sound like the ache of the human soul? Over and over and over, through culture and through time, people are aching for, looking for, the fountain of youth, the, the source of help me live forever. Where is immortality to be found? It is to be found in Jesus Christ. He's unveiled that gift to us as a gift from the one and only immortal God. Wow. He is immortal, who alone has that, as the essence of his being, unlike us, who dwells in unapproachable light. It speaks of God's transcendence. That means he's above. He's over everything. You can't quite get to, to wrap your mind around a God like this. He dwells. He lives. His space is this space of unapproachable light. Like, we're searching for a way to describe him. We're aching and reaching. How can we describe this living God? He's living, dwelling in unapproachable light. This is majesty, glory, beauty, awe. He's infinite. There's no comparison. We're, what words could we do? What, what words could we grab to describe him? And so this speaks of God's glory. That shining presence when, when Moses in Exodus was, was about to be visited by this living God, and he says, no, you can't see me, or you'll die. I'm unapproachable in my person, but I will show you my back as I pass by. I will hide you in the cleft of the rock. Do you remember the story? Do you remember the, the story on the Mount of Transfiguration? Here's Jesus Christ himself, and he's got three guys with him, they climb and they get to see this moment where it says that he was, he, he was transfigured, his form totally changed and blinded by the light of this presence of Jesus Christ. It's as if a little curtain was pulled back. But here's this, this God living, clothed in flesh, miraculously and possibly, and yet he wanted a little peek into who he was and what was going on. Resplendence, light. So much so that they fall to the ground in fear. Over and over, God describes himself with these kinds of terms. John says that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And when he introduces us to Jesus Christ, he says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. We could track that word light all through the scriptures, and it will blow our minds. But right here it's saying, who dwells, who lives in this unapproachable light. And Wayne Grudem comments on it this way. He says, it's very appropriate that God's revelation should be accompanied by such splendor and brightness. Friends, I'm not going to be able to get you where you need to be to wrap your minds around this. All I can do is just show you the words and we can all sit back in awe. He's immortal. He's blindingly glorious. And he's unseen. He dwells in this unapproachable light. This one, this he of whom we're speaking, he is the one whom no one has ever seen or can see. Now this is causing some questions, perhaps. We're going to get there in just a moment, but 
Grudem helps us here again by saying that God's total essence will never be seen. And yet he wills that he should be revealed in things that he has created, and particularly and especially through his son, Jesus Christ. He's unseeable. Over and over, the scriptures tell us, John chapter 6, God is being described by Jesus, says, you have to worship him in spirit and in truth, because God is spirit, unseen. So here's the miracle as we think through these qualities, these attributes just laid out before us. And remember, this is not a, a, a classroom lesson that Paul is giving. Paul is just saying, I was just mentioning Jesus, and hold the presses, I want to stop right here and just burst forth with some words of praise declaring who he is. That's what Paul's doing. How can an immortal God lay down his life for us? Deathlessness. How can an unapproachable light be approached? How can an unseen God be seen and known? My friends, the answer is in Jesus Christ. Wrapped in flesh, he, he submitted himself to death, though death could not hold him. Wrapped in flesh, all of a sudden the unapproachable light of the glory of God was the one that he said, let the little children come to me. Approachable by any and all with compassion and grace. An unseen God suddenly is seen. Paul said in Colossians that this is the image of the invisible God. You want to know the invisible God? He's being declared right here to Timothy. You want to see the invisible God? Then you see him walking and living and talking and teaching and giving his life so everyone would have the chance to come into that glory, into that resplendence, that beautiful place that all of us is aching for, to join in with eternal life. Wow. So, how do we respond? Paul, as he finishes up this, this burst, this little doxology, he just couldn't help himself. As he finishes mentioning these traits, here comes the declaration. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. What Paul is doing is as he thinks about, he meditates on, he soaks in the truth of this God who's been revealing himself over time. And he repeats these attributes, these truths that have been, been shown throughout, not just his thoughts, but the, the pages of the scriptures. As he does that, he begins to say a positive statement about what should be so. He says, to him be honor and eternal dominion. How do we respond? We respond in three ways, and I want to spend some time here describing these. We ascribe. What he's doing here is he's ascribing to God the glory that's due his name. It's not a word we use in our everyday language, perhaps. A proper definition says that to ascribe is to say or think that something is caused by, comes from, or is associated with a particular person or thing. He is saying that honor and glory come from and are caused by and they're associated with God. Let's, let's place it upon him with our thoughts, with our words, with our actions to acknowledge, to declare, to sort of hand over to God the idea that to you, God, belongs these two things, honor and eternal dominion. So Paul is saying, I'm not holding on to honor. I'm ascribing it to you. I'm giving it to you. That, that honor, we know that word, it's that lifting up, that, that holding high, that, that declaring, that sense that this one is worthy is a good word. And Paul is ready to say, let's place that honor upon him who is these things. And as he places that, he begins to also ascribe to this God eternal dominion. Eternal, everlasting, ongoing, no change, no term limits, 
No, I'm done with that in a later season. He's saying, God, I am going to hand over, I'm going to put upon you, I'm going to declare with my thoughts and the, the whole of my person that the dominion belongs, is rightly in your hands. Now, when we read it, it sounds like a nice thing to say in church. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Like someone in a robe could finish a service and we'd all feel good about being in a religious place. But listen, if you think about what Paul is doing as he ascribes these things to God, he is saying dominion is okay in your hands. And I submit to you that in our context, that is a difficult statement. In your own personal life, in our sense of a political life, in understanding of power as a, as a general thing. How often are we ready and willing and, and actually jumping at the chance to give power into one set of hands? It's a fearful thing. Power corrupts, absolutely, they say. This is the incorruptible God. And if you want anyone to have all the power and all the dominion, you want that to be the, the everlasting situation always going on, you want it to be this God. Because as you hear these magisterial statements about him, don't forget the whole of his being. This God who is light is the God who is love. This God who is in power is the God who is humble and compassionate. There's no one like him. There's no one who can hold it all together in perfect unity. And he does. And he should reign. He should reign. And we should want that. We should be okay with that. Because of the goodness of his character. And that leads us to the, the second thing we do. Can we say, in the same way as Paul, let's ascribe to him the honor which is a, he must become greater and I must become less. Can we ascribe to him dominion? You see, as we begin to think like that, then the second thing as we think about how to respond is to submit. We ascribe and we submit. Are we ready to willingly come underneath and acknowledge he reigns, I do not? That's the next step is to submit to this God. To come, and as he declares himself, as he is, we say, Amen. So be it. That's right, and that's good. And I come underneath it. But friends, when I talk about submitting to this living God, you realize there are massive implications. It means the decisions you make don't get to be just your decisions. It means that the life that you live is not just for you. It means all kinds of things that you've been trained in our culture and in our sinful being to think and to believe aren't so that I have to come under this God and be okay living there. To ascribe to Him these qualities only leads logically to submit then to Him rightly holding those qualities. And then... If we can humble ourselves, I think that's why the scripture talks about dying to ourselves in order to be able to live with Christ. As a, to do a sin as well. But we die to ourselves and let him reign. Here's the third piece. We celebrate. Oh, let's ascribe to the Lord honor and dominion. Let's submit to the Lord under his honor and his dominion. And then let's let that be the greatest delight of our lives. Oh, what a place to be. You know, our society is aching for things to be right. Everybody wants something to be made right. Who will make things good again? Where is there going to be some good? Who can sort out all of the pieces so that the place that we dwell is going to be a place that we want to be without all of the, the trappings and problems and difficulties. You know who's going to do that? Jesus is because he's going to come again. He's going to establish his kingdom. And when this king reigns and sin is put away, only the righteous will be there and they will have the delight of living in a place where all of those things are made right. Amen. Praise God. That's why this is not just some statements of theology. Theology is for doxology. 
I can't even begin to break these down for you. I can't begin to understand how in the person of Jesus and the, the, the Father and the Holy Spirit, all these things hold together. And yet here he is describing these indescribable things. And the reason he's doing it is because his heart is overflowing with worship. What a God. Oh, that I could just be in his house. Oh, that I could be near him. Oh, that my life would find its meaning in honestly and all, all the time giving praise and honor and glory to this God. That's the delight of our lives. It's what you were made for. What's the chief end of man? He would glorify God and enjoy him forever. I've quoted Tozer a number of times. You're going to be wondering... Some things that you can do. I, if you want a couple books to unpack these things, two of my favorites are J.I. Packer, Knowing God, and A.W. Tozer, Knowledge of the Holy. They're simply studies of the attributes of God in biblical accuracy and, and magisterial verbiage. They'll make your heart come alive and be awakened to these realities. So, that's why I've been quoting abundantly from both Packer and Tozer. And I'm going to finish us there. Because Tozer, after his study, he, he asked the question, well then what's the counsel? What do we do? How would you advise me to sort of like move forward from this? And his words will be better than mine, so we're going to finish with this. He says, it is simply the old and ever new counsel. What do you advise? The old and ever new counsel. Acquaint yourself with God. To know God is at once the easiest and the most difficult thing in the world. It is easy because the knowledge is not won by hard mental toil. But it is something freely given. But this knowledge is difficult because there are conditions to be met. And the obstinate nature of fallen man does not take kindly to them. First, we must forsake our sins. Second, there must be an utter committal of the whole life to Christ in faith. Third, there must be a reckoning of ourselves to have died unto sin and to be alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Fourth, we must boldly repudiate the cheap values of the fallen world. Fifth, we must practice the art of long and loving meditation upon the majesty of God. And sixth, as the knowledge of God becomes more wonderful, greater service to our fellow men will become for us imperative. I couldn't advise you how to respond to a passage like this any better. So all I have to do is to ask you, where are you at in this lineup of steps? Have you forsaken your sins as a first step to responding to this living God? Is there an utter committal of the whole life to Christ in faith? Perhaps that's the, the response. When you realize there's no other. He's greater and more beautiful and more kind than I could ever have imagined because he came for me. He gave his life for me. He wants me and he wants to put away sin and let me live righteously with him in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Perhaps that's a place to respond are we constantly, as believers, reckoning ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God? Is there a trajectory of, of gaining power over those old things from the old man? And maybe somewhere to press in in response to this. Are we boldly repudiating the cheap values of the world? Saying, I'm done with that system. It's fallen. It's false. And it'll kill you. I want life. I want the immortal God. I want the one who lives in unapproachable light. I want to be there. Are we learning to just meditate upon God? Are we so hurried that a little time with this Bible open and just sitting and letting the words of the scripture soak in is too hard for us to be in his presence? And is, are all these things compelling us as a natural reaction to the kind of God that he's shown us to be, to be thinking of others, full of good acts and kindness and, and declaring.
Because Paul stamps at the end of this his amen. And that amen means, so be it. Let it be so. I pray that the declaration of our heart, as God shows himself to us, is that we would say, so be it. Let him have the honor. Let him have the dominion. And anyone who gets to receive of the, of the goodness of that glory is going to find their greatest joy and their greatest delight. That word amen, some have said, is translated into more languages without hardly any change than anything else. It may be the most commonly known word on planet Earth. So why don't we all together, as we sit before this great God, just say, amen. amen. Father, I don't know how to approach you. I don't know how to understand you. Words fail me and time fails me. All I can plead is Jesus Christ, our mediator, our intercessor, our savior, the one who's made life and immortality and brought that to life through the good news of the gospel. Jesus, we honor your name. Help us to do so not just in word, but with our whole self, mind, heart, soul, and strength that we might be living in your greatest commandment and let the rest of life flow from that. I pray this for each of these people here, myself included, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, this has been a, a soaking in and sitting before just the qualities of God because we need to remember. So we end our service with a particular remembrance that Jesus called us to. He gave us that, that chance to, to not float and stray and get away with just the busyness and forget that at the center of it all, at the crux of humanity and, and divinity, is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I just want to give you a moment to reflect on that. And after that, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. As we give often, just the reminders that if you're a believer, take this time and let it be that anchoring, that drawing you back in towards the center of gravity. But that cross represents the cross that Jesus died on. And without it, you would be obliterated in the presence of the one who lives in unapproachable life. This God, so majestic, would also humble himself like a servant. Humble himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. Just, just remember him. Friend, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, meaning you haven't given him the dominion of your life, my invitation to you is like I've been saying a moment ago, take the early steps of turning from sin and repentance and allowing yourself to be tied into the person and the work of Jesus Christ and say, if he died for sin, then I want to die with him because my old man is a mess. But I believe that if I trust him as the living God, he's also the one who is immortal. He can give eternal life to those who believe. Your, your step in this moment is to avoid the spiritual ritual of the juice in the cup if it's not genuine to your heart. And instead, take a few moments as we have this quiet moment to just search your heart. Ask where I'm at with the Lord. Prepare yourself to respond. If he's calling, if he's tugging, you need to come. Your life depends on it. Take these moments, and then in a moment, I'll lead us, and we'll corporately just take these elements together to remember Jesus Christ.
also deliver to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. He broke it after he had given thanks. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. bread and drinks this cup, we share in it together, we share in your continual life-giving work in us, and that we proclaim your death until you come. Oh, help us to stay the course until the beautiful, terrible, amazing day of the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. In your time, to your honor, may honor Eternal dominion be yours forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
has helped you see he is indeed worthy. I pray that he goes with you from this place to continue to proclaim his excellencies as the people redeemed by his blood sent out to go tell others so that he might receive more glory, more honor, more praise because he's worthy. Have a great week in the Lord. Love one another well. Love you. Have a great time this week. I love you.